I'm really happy to be here and, uh, and appreciate all of you there staying. Um, what I, I don't know why Elizabeth invited me because I, I think she explained I'm a little bit of a contrarian. Um, but it's from experience. Um, I've worked in this field for 35 years. I worked in this field and to make the decision to come into it because I was raised by a single mom, Mexican, Latina, third grade education that brought two kids to the United States because she wanted to work hard. She didn't come here to be a criminal. She didn't come here to be on charity. She didn't come here to live in tolerable poverty. She came here because she was willing to work hard and almost all the people that were our neighbors were also willing to work very hard. That's what they thought defined America. What we found is that um, working hard actually was not recognized. Uh, even when people wanted to offer help, they wanted to actually classify her as a charity case. And so they would offer maybe childcare. Same thing with my sister. My sister got married to this wrong guy. He would beat her up. And people would offer welfare, childcare, uh, food, all of those things. But as soon as my sister stabilized and started getting a job, they started taking those things away from her. And so she was never able to become independent and stay away from this guy that would beat her, who would promise never to hit her again. And so we have a, a problem is that most of our sec social sector system is really set up to make poverty tolerable. That's what we claim is our big success after 50 years, more than 50 years of the war on poverty. The problem is, raising teenagers, I learned that actually to make poverty escapable, you actually have to resource and actually recognize talent and initiative. So I would look at my kids, it's like, okay, what are you good at? Do you wanna try this, you wanna try that? And you back that. It's, it's a very human thing, that if you want sustained upward mobility, if you want to actually build something and have people be independent, you have to focus not on their weaknesses, which is really what our, our needs-based means testing system right now. You have to focus on the initiative they take. And so after 20 years of doing social services, I decided that I was doing the wrong thing. My mother would find my services patronizing. I had 120 social workers, uh, administrators, employment specialists, and whatever. And that what I did realize is that we came to this country because this country had a history of people getting into uh, middle class or whatever their, their focus was by working together really hard. So if you can imagine African Americans before and after slavery built 50 townships just in Oklahoma. And it was a period when they were totally isolated by government, by everybody else. They got no help, not only that, but they, their communities and their towns were destroyed. Well, the Chinatowns at least weren't burned down. The Polish, the Irish, all of these folks, how did they do that before there were all of us helping them? Well, they did it by working together. Um, I was asked to cut my presentation short, so I'm gonna go through some of these slides really fast and some I'm gonna totally skip, sorry. Um, but it's probably good for you. Um, what you should learn about is positive deviance. You know, the, the general stereotype is families don't know what to do and therefore we have to go counsel them and advise them. Uh, when I started this project, I basically said, we're gonna learn from families like mine. My mother did not find poverty tolerable, or, or did not find it complex. I was on the board of the California Endowment and what you heard here from the foundation folks is that we have to be patient, poverty is really complex. This is after 50 years or more of sinking in a lot of money. Well, the fact is that it is complex for us because every family is different. It is not as complex for my mother. She knew what we had to deal with. She knew she, if she wanted to get me into college, she had to save this month, she had to take care of the car the next month. These are all things you will never know by any program that you have. The fact is that people have to build their lives in the way they have to build their lives. And they're the only ones that know. So the other thing is that they learn from each other. So if, you know, my mother was always looking at, well, you know, so-and-so did this, and I think we could do that, but we may do it a little bit differently. That's how those townships were built. The other thing you should know, I'm not gonna go into a diffusion strategy, diffusion theory, which is if you want change, it's not gonna come through policy or big programs. It's gonna come when expectations change. It's a human quality of when you see neighbors and something gets tested out, if there's a good idea, What's gonna happen is that you know, you're the first Polish worker in a meat factory in Chicago. So when they succeed, they get a few of their cousins and then those cousins come in and they start doing well and all of a sudden, then everybody's like, oh, actually working in meat factories may be a, a, a first step for all of us. Uh, the one story I wanna tell you um, is that one of my biggest lessons was about seven months when I first started this prog program, 
uh, I don't, I'm not supposed to call it a program. It's a project, because we don't provide any services. We fire staff to provide any services. Anyway, so uh, the biggest example for me was we were working with refugees from the war in El Salvador. And there were, about, there were five families. One of them, which was a very ordinary family, didn't talk very much, came in one day, said they're going to buy a house. And over there, were like, well, how are you going to buy a house? They had no savings because they sent all their money back to El Salvador in remittances. And they had run into this Spanish-speaking real estate agent broker who promised them he could get them the, the house. And my staff was over there. He's a predatory lender. Can we talk to them? Can we get them to financial counseling? I'm over there, no. You know, what I promised Jerry Brown when we started this is like there will be no counseling from the outside. What we were there to do is learn the capacity of families to help themselves and each other. So I don't want to blur all that data. And so obviously, you know, my staff kind of stepped back and sure enough, the broker was able to get them that house, but their mortgage payment was 65% of their income. My staff comes to me, they're going to lose the house and I'm over there looking at this, yeah, they're not going to be able to buy food for the whole year. So. For us, then, it was like, did we fail the family? Then the lesson starts. So the next thing that happens is that these families realize that they were stuck with this predatory lender. They were too far, too far down the line. So they had all their friends that they'd borrowed money for to pay for all these different fees. They descended on this house, repainted it, retiled it, re-landscaped it. Six months later, had me sit in on a refinance, got their payments down to 40%. And they actually were able to keep the house and still own that house, OK? That was my first lesson is I was, you know, I'm going to fire staff that want to interfere from now on. Second thing was that the other four families that were in that cohort saw that Jorge Maria Elena could do it. Their red line for savings, because that's what this is supposed to be about. I'm supposed to talk to you about my data system. Anyway, so the savings line for all these families started going up. And I'm over there, how come you're not sending your money back to El Salvador? I said, well, if Jorge Maria Elena can buy a house, we can buy a house. Within a year and a half, all of the other four families have bought homes in the United States. That was the second lesson. Third lesson was that those were the early adopters. If you look at uh, diffusion theory, so Jorge Maria Elena was a positive deviant. Then there were early adopters. Once there were enough early adopters, then people think, oh, actually, ordinary folks can do this. And that is, this is tipping point. <laughs> I know <he's, laughs> Daniel's not here. But um, basically, the early adopters are what's important. You may all have great ideas, but until there really is a testing in the natural market, you won't know if it's really worth anything. The early adopters are the most important thing. And when it happened very naturally within the Salvadoran community, then all of a sudden, expectations changed. This happened in the Mien community. This happened in the Mardi Gras Indian tribes. These are some things that we've seen and we've seen very naturally occurring. But they don't come from programs, and they don't come from leaders. Um, this is some of the success. This is with no policy change, no programs, no counseling from my staff. Incomes go up, debt goes down, savings go up. They start businesses. They do whatever they feel is important to do. The other piece is that you read Bowling Alone, and everybody thinks that, well, people won't work together. The fact is they will. The fact is that is really what they want to do. And so one of the things that has happened is we had three families uh, that were involved in lending circles in San Francisco, accumulating about $3,000 annually that they then borrow. Well, three and a half years later, it was one point, oh, good, I got 10 minutes. <laughs> I, I'll talk slower then. <laughs> OK. Oh, no, she put out six minutes. That's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so these three families, the Boston family starts saying, oh, so those families started lending, so who used to do that in Columbia? Three and a half years later, the, at this point, it was at 1.3. Four years later, now we have over 50 groups that have formed off of the first ideas of those three. We had early adopters, and then it became something that everybody was willing, everybody that wanted to was willing to do. So now the accumulation is 1.5 million. You know how, again, with philanthropy, they talk about we don't have enough money, and we have to talk about government and whatever. The fact is, those townships that were built, they weren't built because philanthropy was there, because philanthropy had enough money, because government had enough money. It wasn't. This was self-financed. You know, it was all that self. And so those are the folks, those, those initiatives, that type of collective action is actually how we built the stupid country. You know, the, that self-financing we never bring into. It, like all the discussion here and almost every conference I've gone to for 35 years, we talk to ourselves. We never talk to the experts. And who's the experts? The experts are these families. 
you know, those are the ones that actually know how they have to deal with their lives, and there are patterns through it. So I'm gonna get to the, the data piece. So the dilemma is that to survive, Fred Blackwell, the president of the San Francisco Foundation, asked me, so you collect all this data, so do you know how these families survive on 20 and 25,000 in the Bay Area? Because if you imagine trying to survive in the Silicon Valley in the Bay Area on 20, 25,000, it, like, it takes a lot of resourcefulness. And I said, yeah, they give us data. We give the families a computer. They journal every month. And they tell us anything that changed in their life. We have over 200 data points so that we don't just collect things and they'll only look at those types of things. We had a really wide spectrum of data. And what they do is they give us a picture of their life on a monthly basis by individual. We're tracking about 8,000 adults, teens, and children in about six or eight cities at this point in time. And so we can see what their lives are like, how much debt they have to take, when they have to do it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, by having the computer at the home and by having basically uh, an online journaling system, they get to see something like this. They get to see uh, uh, what, excuse me, because then you have time to look at this thing. Anyway, um, they get to see kind of what it, they're doing. So let's say the blue line on there on the graph is their income. They also get to see what their cohorts are doing. Remember I told you about the Salvadoran refugee? We only used to enroll families with friends because they were told staff at FII is not allowed to give you any counseling direction or advice, and if they do, they get fired. We have only fired four staff so far. The red line is the cohorts. So they're, oh, the rest of the Salvadoran families are doing that? Well, maybe I could do that, or maybe I'm doing better, whatever. So it's more like Fitbit, okay? So they get an instant feedback right now, because it's cloud-based in real time. Families get to see what they're doing themselves against what other families are doing. The other piece is that when that lending circle thing happened, that they actually wanted to connect with the other families. And they asked us, the staff, could you connect us? And I'm over there. My staff is not allowed to do anything, so uh, we told them, use Facebook, whatever. We basically had to set up a, a social media site, a community building site. And this is where they actually, uh, at least, I think, um, had talked about a lot of this. So essentially there, they can form groups, they can blog, they can talk to each other. The, there's a set of resources that they've asked us to test out in terms of eligibility, because a lot of what we design, it sounds really good, and there's always a few people, because they're needy, can get it. But basically, these families, these 2,000 more families, are actually helping us design a set of benefits that work for them and work for enough of them. That's the middle part. On the bottom, it's that we basically have families in all different parts of the country that have actually faced every situation that every other family has, whether their kid is having trouble. And what, you know, this has been going on, poverty has been going on for a long time. And what ends up happening is that somebody has been a positive deviant and has come up with some kind of solution. And so what they're able to do is put themselves up as, I figured out how my undocumented husband could get emergency medical care because we found out the Mexican embassy actually has an emergency care for undocumented. Okay? So that is a piece of knowledge that my staff would never have had. And so instead, it goes up here in terms of somebody being the expert. Other people then go to them and say, well, how did you do it? How did you buy the house? How did you find a business? We basically are crowdsourcing solutions. The solutions I see that are being crowdsourced don't match what we keep designing here. You know, great ideas, and it isn't that some people won't get it, but the fact is the solutions we come up here with here are not demand-driven. You know, what we need to do is make sure, because rich folks, we try to find out what they want, and Amazon tracks all of us, and they want to know what's the demand, and then they try to meet that. That's what our system allows for. If you can imagine 8,000 individuals being tracked on a monthly basis. We have tens of thousands of data points. So when you start getting into that, you can do, you basically have big data. This is the resources. This is what we can do with the data. We can do regression studies, geospatial mapping. I think it was Atwe, Atwe that uh, was talking about. Yeah, so skip these. I'm hoping there's time for some questions. Um, so he talked about geospatial mapping. So for the California Endowment, then they were interested in, in food uh, and healthy food, organic food. And what we were learning is that our families were growing organic food in their little plots and boxes, and they were sharing it. 
Okay, and so like, well, they're sharing it. Is that because there's no grocery store there and they're doing it? And, and it didn't fall into all the patterns that we kept thinking. So these are things that data and actually getting it directly from families is possible to do now. If Amazon can track us individually, actually, we can do the same thing. We built the system, the system is there, people can build. Foundations have the money to actually help us build all these systems, to survey. Um, so these are some of the things that I think are very possible and are actually being done. The other thing I just want to emphasize is that this issue of positive deviance, the fact is that the expertise is really in the community itself, okay? And you're gonna have to recognize that, and you have to be much more humble. So you're gonna have to be able to adjust whatever your idea is and not say, well, you know, actually, they don't know what's good for them. The other thing is if you want change, it's not gonna come from policy, certainly not federal policy at this point in time. Most of the time is gonna be spent fighting just to preserve whatever we might have had. But the fact is that in four years, a, a, a single mom like my mom with a 16 year old, her kid's gonna be 20 at the end of that time. And a lot of life happens in that period of time. So this isn't a thing about being patient. I don't think I'm as patient as I used to be. This is our system. Again, everybody gets a computer. They go online every month. They journal uh, about what has changed for every member of their family after we have a baseline. We validate and verify that data every three months. The family also then can see what other families are doing. They can go to Up Together, which is a social media site, to find other experts, to connect with other people so they don't count on our staff. They can also get access to Kiva. We could be a trustee. The final point is that because we have longitudinal data from these families then, and what we've seen is that they are really resourceful and reliable. Just imagine what it takes to live on 25, I got it. <laughs> that um, what's fascinating is we can see that they're actually very resourceful and really reliable. So for loans and for whatever, we've tested different underwriting criteria because half of our families don't have uh, any credit score or a decent credit score, and they can't access the normal financial systems. So we've developed an alternative credit score that pre-qualifies them for the awards that we give, whether it's scholarships, we do give scholarships, we give all of these other things. And um, now we're talking to Beneficial Bank and some other folks about using our credit score. What we know is that because right now our families get electronic transfers when they pre-qualify and get an award for family time or health match or whatever, that transfer can be done within 24 hours. We can compete with predatory lenders at this point in time because their big advantage was they could turn things around. We could take out predatory lenders. If our families, once they qualify, they can get access to what they need. So I would really like to get, take predatory lenders out at that point in time. So I'm gonna stop there and, oh, well, I guess there's no time for questions. Anyway, I'll be around. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.